Hola, hola. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Mujer de Éxito Unbounded, Woman of Success Without Limits. This is Marty Angel, your host, and I am so incredibly grateful for you to be here on this podcast and this episode. You know, there are no coincidences in this world. There is no coincidence that you stop by to hear this episode. It is important that you understand that sometimes we speak English and sometimes we speak Espanol and sometimes we speak Spanglish. Hablamos Espanol, hablamos Inglés y a veces hablamos Spanglish. But anyway, you look at it. This episode is going to be amazing. Once again, this is Marty Angel, your host, Empowering Latina Coach. I am a Latina business coach, and I help the bilingual Latina women entrepreneurs, mujerpreneurs, gain clarity and focus on who they serve so they can up-level from brick and mortar to click and order and rock their six figures. I love coaching the mujerpreneur. But let's get to it. You will enjoy today's episode. I'm so excited. Hoy vamos a tener una plática sumamente importante. Yo sé que les va a gustar. Ready? And today's episode is sponsored by... Dancing crew, trip for two, nail the final interview, game with Doug, brand new mug, come here kid, give me a hug. The more you want to do, the more we want to do. Boosters designed for COVID-19 variants are now available. If you've had your primary series, schedule an updated COVID-19 booster appointment as soon as you're eligible. Sponsored by Pfizer and BioNTech. Welcome to the episode of Mujer de Éxito Unbounded, Woman of Success Without Limits. And today's episode, guys, I am so incredibly grateful because today's episode is all about what? You don't speak Spanish and you're Latina? What? Right? And, and, And I have a special guest on. So this is a topic that we're going to continue to, to kind of massage for a while. This so happens that this week I have a couple of guests that really um, can help us understand that. And, and what's the stigma behind it? And why is it that we have these preconceived notions and stereotypical thoughts and, um, you know, and we've been socially indoctrinated to think that there's only one way and there isn't only one way. So again, this is your host, Marty Angel, Empowering Latina Coach, Latina Biz Coach. And I just want to remind you that I get so excited because I get my, my purpose is to empower the Latina woman, the bilingual, the BIPOC woman. And my guest, like I said, is, is an amazing person, but I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But basically, people always ask me, what do you do, Marty? So here's what I do. I help the... Latina by and bilingual, you know, let mujerpreneur gain clarity and focus on who they serve so they can up level from brick and mortar to click and order and finally begin to rock their six figure biz. So that's what I do. Now, as I said today, my guest is mm -hmm. a beautiful young lady that actually I met many moons ago, and I'm not going to date myself or her. But she was my student. As you all know, I was a college professor. I'm just a newly, a newly repurposed college professor. And I'm repurposed and, and I'm finding my purpose in to empower the Latina woman. But this young lady is an amazing young lady. I followed her and her um, success. And as I remind you, uh, this podcast is about Latina is going from, you know, Latina is going from struggle to surviving to thriving. And this young lady is definitely thriving. 
Please help me to welcome my beautiful young guest, Leticia. Welcome, welcome to Mujer de Éxito Unbounded. Please say a few words to our listeners about who are you? What do you do? So hi, everyone. My name is Leticia, as Marty said. And right now, I work as a marketing manager for a cybersecurity company. And then I have my own freelance business on the side where I do copywriting and podcast producing. And that's me in a nutshell. As Marty mentioned, I met her many moons ago when I was a young, young, young lady. And so she's seen me grow over many moons. I would say about um, over don't count years. the moons <laughs> over don't. 15 years i want to say i could be wrong i know <laughs> i hope you're wrong right <laughs> I, it, luckily you know luckily i stopped teaching uh, college algebra for a while and and you know x plus y you know and mm-hmm. we're not going to do two x plus two y or anything like that right right no um, problem as either but let me, let me, um, really, this is a topic that is really important and it is something that I've run up against. And so last month was the, was the Hispanic heritage month. And one of the things that I found that I thought had pretty much gone away and I thought maybe my husband was the only one, but, um, a lot of people, have this this notion, this stereotype, this indoctrination in their head that if you are Latina, you speak Spanish, right? Mm-hmm. And and so I know that that's not always. I, as a college educator and as a you know K through twelve educator, know that that's not true. I personally, from experience, know that that is absolutely not true. But I would like to, you know, to take you back to your, to your roots. Tell us a little bit about where you were born. And then, you know, let's talk a little bit about what, what's, what what was your life like not being able to speak Spanish? And, you know, what was it like? Did people come up to you? You know, give us a little bit about that. Yeah, so my parents, my mom is Mexican. My dad was from El Salvador. Um, my, you know, so my dad was born in El Salvador. My mom was born in Mexico. I was born in Mexico. Um, my mom and I, we were born in Tijuana. And when I was about four years old, um, we came to the United States. And my mom was a living nanny in Orange County for a wealthy family. So I came along. And so I went to a very American school community where there weren't a lot of Latinos so when I was little my first language was Spanish but since my mom didn't speak it to me and she wanted me to learn English you know kind of adapt to American life she stopped speaking to me in Spanish and then I just focused on English I really struggled learning English as a kid Um, I remember in kindergarten um, I think I was failing kindergarten because they called my mom and they had her come in for like a parent teacher conference. And I remember to this day, even though I'm man thirties, I still remember being five years old and I couldn't get the lifespan of a toad right. And I had the whole lifespan backwards. So I knew something was wrong. And they told me that, you know, I wasn't understanding English. And so I, you know, all of elementary school, I remember I always had extra work to do. I had wow. to read more. I They always gave me extra credit. And so I always had to read more, write more, and do a lot of things. I remember looking up things in the encyclopedia before Google. So that's what I remember as being a kid. Do you, um, do you remember so that any of the kids, the way they treated you, do you remember any of that? Um, as a kid, no, I think everyone, you know, we always just played together. But I do remember there was one other girl that was Latina in my class. And they would always put us together because I think they thought we would understand each other. But I feel like we didn't always understand each other. 
Mm, like yeah. I felt like her Spanish was a lot more intense than mine. So we didn't really understand each other because then I started, you know, grasping on English, but, you know, I didn't really connect with her. And then it wasn't until like I was maybe fourth, fifth grade. That's when I really started connecting with the other kids, but I never got bullied or anything in the elementary school level. Okay, great, great. So I, you know, let's share stories here. I, Mm -hmm. um, I was born in the U.S. and this is what I want the listeners to see is what's the contrast here. I was born in the U.S., of course, many moons before you were. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) I was born in the U.S., but my parents, my dad was educated from Mexico and Mm -hmm. my mom also from Mexico. And, um, you know, but she came over when she was 13. So she actually graduated from high school here. But Spanish was my first language as well. So um, and because they came from Mexico, it was Mexican Spanish. So um, and I had a completely different. That's why this is so important that people understand not every Latina and every Latino learns the same way. We're the same as anybody else. Right. There might be um, more, um, you know, there might be, you know, some. I'm dyslexic. I'm dyslexic. I didn't know that until after I was a school principal, you know, Um, Mm -hmm. I was didn't even realize that when they said, you know, but what ended up happening with me was I got actually because I was doing so well in kindergarten, I actually got Uh, pushed up to first grade. So I went to kindergarten only half the year and the rest of the year I went in first grade, right? I went in first grade Mm -hmm. and I'll never forget this. Um, I was the only Spanish speaker and I, to this day, I still talk to myself and answer myself, but back (laughs) in the day, I was, I was talking to myself. I mean, I was looking at myself. I do mirror work now, but you know, I was talking to myself and I was looking at, you know, at myself and, and I had this little mirror and I always would, you know, look at the mirror and talk to myself and I would talk to myself in Spanish. So I was, I was actually slapped across the face by my first grade teacher for speaking Spanish. Mm. So I was wondering did anything similar like that happen to you? Were you chastised? Were you other than they gave you, you know, what was the feeling like? Um, I think at an elementary level, I think because I was so little, I didn't really understand what was happening. It just felt like everything was hard. I always felt like I wasn't good enough or, you know, I felt like I had to prove myself just as much as the other kids, because I felt like I was always under a microscope. And then it wasn't until middle school, I was, my mom switched me schools from the one I was supposed to go to traditionally. And it was a bit more, how can you say it? It was more diverse than the original school I was supposed to go to, because then that's when I was like around more Latino kids, more African-American kids. You know, it wasn't just all white people. And then like me and like a few Hispanic people, it was like it felt like it was a bit more diverse. And then I was like, oh, like there's more people like me out there. It's not just me. You know, I didn't feel so kind of out of place anymore. But even then, I felt like those kids, they didn't speak Spanish either. It was just like, okay, we're we're in America, we're learning English, you know, and that was just the way it was. But then when we moved to San Diego, my senior year of high school, you know, I moved to San Diego and I was like right at the border. So all these kids, you know, they were, you know, going to Mexico every weekend and all of that. And you could tell that they're, they mostly spoke Spanish. And when we were in class... I remember the teachers were talking in Spanish and then I remember I said something like, why are we speaking in Spanish? You know, if we're in America, you know, that indoctrination got in my head, like we're in America, we speak English, you know, cause I work so hard to learn English. And I remember it was a math class and I remember he kind of looked at me like, well, you're Mexican, you should speak Spanish. And I told him I didn't. 
because I did it. And then all the other kids looked at me funny, like, why, why don't you speak Spanish if you're Mexican? And they told me that too. Yeah. See, and, and, and so that's so crazy. I'm sorry you had to go through that. I mean, I'm sorry all of us had to go through that. I'm sure that many of the listeners out there have their own stories, right? Mm -hmm. But you were able to, you know, you were able to, to wade through the, you know, I, I call it the seaweed of the education world, right? It, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's just, you know, they put you in. Um, now, let me, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Were you put in like special classes or whatever? I remember for, you know, how you have to take a language so you can graduate high school. So I was put into Spanish, but I was put not in like the regular white people version Spanish class. They put me in Spanish speaking classes, which oh. was harder for me because I could barely speak it. The words were like a foreign thing to me. Writing it was something I'd never done before. And I remember like some of the words that were very long. I had a hard <laughs> time enunciating and I'm like, I can't say it. <laughs> I can't say it. But I okay, remember, let's see, let's see. I don't know. Like, immediately, <laughs> it took me a long time to learn to say. Do you, do you roll your R's? Do you roll your R's? Yeah. Let's see. Carro? Let's hear. Vamos al carro. Right. <laughs> but I will so. say this. I This I do remember. So when I was, I want to say, a sophomore and a junior, I took Spanish class, you know, in the Spanish-speaking class. Um, and our teacher was from, I believe he was from Costa Rica. And I remember that was the first time I ever heard kind of that guilt like we we're talking about like why don't you speak Spanish you should speak Spanish this is something that you want to pass down you know when you have kids like you want to make sure that you teach them Spanish and he was just very harsh about it and like very had that macho pride of like you know if you're from wherever country that speaks Spanish you should speak Spanish and like to me that was a foreign concept at the time I, you know i was 15 16 and i'm like what are you talking about like this whole time you know they've been telling me well you live in america you got to learn english you got to speak english right you know and and uh and i i get i get that you know being a former former formal educator right <laughs> my say you i bet you can't say that 10 times you know together, together, fast, fast, right? Former, formal educator. Yeah, that's about <laughs> as fast as it's going to come out, right? Yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, so the sad part about this is, and this is what I, you know, being an educator, I saw this firsthand. And I saw both spectrums, both sides of the spectrum. I had, um, you know, I had people that were in my classes that didn't speak a lick of Spanish, but they ended up in my bilingual classes. They called it bilingual education, right? And, mm -hmm. um, but the point was, was that um, they were, they were supposed to be in my class, but I wasn't allowed to speak Spanish to them, which was really dumb in my opinion, because then, then what happens is, is you, you don't really enhance their education and their, and their comprehension, because mm -hmm. you have to you have to comprehend something in one language in order to be able to comprehend it in another language. You can't, there's no distinguish, right? You can't mm -hmm. comprehend only in one and not comprehend in the other, right? So it's important for educators to understand that if the child speaks Spanish or doesn't, then the concept needs to be taught in that language that was there, that was not their mother language, but that was their comprehension language. So mm -hmm. your comprehension language was English, even though your first language was Spanish. Mm -hmm. So your comprehension language was English. So, and then because of your, I'm sure it was because of your Spanish surname that they, they, a long time ago, and I, and I'm witness to this, just because you had a Spanish surname, they would stick you 
in in places that I, I don't think that most of the kids belonged. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and um, I had the opposite with 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 me. It was like people would look at me and then because I would tan really good because my dad was half Mexican and half Greek. So I would tan really good like the Greeks do. Right. And mm -hmm. my mom was German, but I took after my dad's skin tone and my mom was German. And so she had blonde hair and blue eyes. So she had the reverse discrimination. Mm -hmm. So she graduated. And when I spoke with her, she doesn't understand how she got her diploma if she couldn't speak a lick of English. But because she was blonde and blue eyed, they kept putting her up and putting her up and putting her up, even though she failed her English classes. That's you know, and so and so it, it's it's the same thing almost with you as you, you got caught up over here. And um, and now let me ask you this now as an adult, mm -hmm. as an adult, has anybody ever I know that you're strong now, but, you know, because you 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 went from struggling and feeling bad. It sounds like feeling bad mm -hmm. because you didn't speak Spanish. Right. Mm -hmm. But I but I think that, and we'll go back into this. I would like for, um, you know, touch upon how you actually became this strong woman that you are and you're very successful. And the, you know, I want people to know that, that, you know, what we do sometimes is we really chop people down because they don't speak Spanish or because they do speak Spanish. But mm -hmm. any way you look at it, it's still a, a prejudice. It's still a discrimination when you come in and you think, oh, look at, she's got brown, brown eyes, dark brown eyes and, and dark brown hair. Uh, mm -hmm. She's Latina, right? And, and she speaks Spanish. Mm -hmm. Where I got the opposite when I was, when I would speak Spanish, even though, they would look at me and go, oh, you speak Spanish? And it was like, yeah, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah. Yeah. It, it came in very handy, I'll tell you, as a high school teacher, because the kids thought I couldn't speak Spanish. <laughs> you're like, I know what you're saying. I, I know what you're saying, and I know what you're up to. <laughs> yeah. And I do remember, like, when I first moved here, and I was on the trolley and on the bus, and I remember people would try to ask me for directions, and, you know, I was just like, I don't I don't know what you're trying to tell me. And I think they thought I was being rude or that I didn't want to help them. It was just like, I don't know how to communicate with you to help you or else I would help you, you know. Uh, you know, that's so beautiful. Let me tell you a story that happened to me. The other thing I look like, so I don't look like anything. I mean, people will look at me and they'll go, oh, you know, I don't know if you really look Spanish and I, you got a big nose. So maybe you're just Greek and, you know, and all of this stuff. And so um, for the longest time here in San Diego, there's a Chaldean community in El Cajon. And we used to live in El Cajon for a period of time. And I remember so clearly having my kids and we walked into a store and over there they speak Chaldean. Mm -hmm. Right. And there were some Chaldean women and she asked me something. And I couldn't speak. I didn't know what she was asking. So I, my eyes got really wide and I said to her, I'm sorry. And she got angry. She actually slapped me in front of my kids. Oh my God. <laughs> yes, I couldn't speak the language. I'm going like, okay, if I don't, if I, even if I was learning it and you slap me, well, honey, I'm not going to speak your language. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so let's talk a little bit about what were your coping skills? What did you, how did you overcome that? Because it sort of plagued you through throughout and who knows, does it, you know, have you run up against that recently as well? What were, you know, I think my coping mechanism is like, I was always taught that everyone is different and, you know, uh, you know, we're not all the same. And I didn't take it personally. I was just like, this was just how I was raised. You know, if obviously if I was taught to speak Spanish more as I kept growing up, you know, I probably, you know, would be okay. And I feel okay that I don't speak Spanish as well. I mean, I know a little bit now, 
because I have to interact with my mom's family because they don't really speak English. So it's more like a Spanglish kind of situation. And then I tell them, you know what I mean? And they're like, yeah, I think so. And then my aunt has adopted my whatever. Because uh, <laughs> before I used to say whatever when I was a teenager a lot. And so sometimes she'll say, oh, like Leticia says, whatever. <laughs> so, you know, I don't, I don't feel bad about it. Like if I really wanted to learn it more, I know I can. You know, I took it in college. And, you know, I don't think there should be any shame about it, you know, at all. Like, it's up to you if you want to learn it or not. Exactly. You know, and that's and that and that's the truth. And the the for me, what what was the turning point, and this is different. My dad was a very, you know, he was educated, um, you know, in in he was actually in pre-med over in Mexico. And uh he it was very important for him that I speak um Spanish correctly. So what what happened with me was when um you know I I love dancing. So I was dancing. So I tried out for the folklorico and, um, you know, the Mexican regional dances and I got accepted at the age of 12. So I was shipped to Mexico from the age of 13 every summer. So that's how I learned to read and write it. Mm -hmm. And I, and I'll tell you, I know what the kids feel like because when I got there, I could not write it. I could mm-hmm. not read it, let alone study it and take a test in it. But that's ended up what happened in order for me to be this professional dancer. I needed to, I needed to, according to them, I needed to know the history of the dance, the history of the costume, the history mm-hmm. of the culture, the history of the tradition and where that dance came about. So it was a lot of studying And Mm -hmm. that's why I speak it so well, right? That's why Mm -hmm. I speak it so well. That's why I understand it so well, Um, you know, and uh, I continue speaking it. And, you know, when I was a a teacher, well, you know, it was just, it came in really handy. It was really important. I got my bilingual credential that way. And, um, but not everybody, my cousins don't speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. I have I have nieces and nephews now that you know they were born here and everything and they kind of understand Spanish and they'll respond to you in English you know it's like they understand a little bit but yeah they don't speak Spanish at all and like they don't get you know hate from the family like oh why don't you speak Spanish or anything like that we just all find a way to understand each other and one of the things I need um to really um hit upon is the fact that speaking another language is 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 beautiful and mm-hmm. it's a tool it's a tool right it's a tool that we can use to help others like you said um like you said when you when you said you felt like um you know you were when people spoke to you on the trolley you felt like if i could speak to you i would help you that's what mm-hmm. happens that's a it's a tool it's not a necessity it's a tool that we we can choose to learn or we can choose not to learn obviously because you're you technically were bilingual when you were small because you were as you were learning the english you were losing the spanish but you were mm-hmm. still there bilingually so the the adaptation of the brain is still there for you and mm-hmm. um, um, and you could, if you chose to, you could learn it and you would probably have way more ease than somebody who doesn't, who wasn't born in that, in that environment. Right. Mm-hmm. But I um, do lose, I do listen to music in Spanish sometimes. And it's like, I understand what they're saying, but like for me to like speak it back sometimes, like I said, some words are really hard for me to pronounce. So it's like, I understand the music and TV And like when my family talks to me, if they don't speak too fast, I understand what they're saying. Or if I don't, I'm like, I don't know what that means. (laughs) And I think that's okay, too, to say like, yes, don't understand. You don't understand. Exactly. Exactly. And they they find a way to like try to describe it to be better. And then I'm like, okay, I I get where they're going or where they're coming from. Yeah. And I want, you know, I really want to hit upon the fact that 
we really need to let go of that stigma that just because you're Latina, you have to speak Spanish, you know, just, Mm -hmm. you know, I was mentioning to you, my, my husband was born in TJ, but he came across, they brought him across at one month old. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, so he spoke and then my, you know, he spoke a different Spanish and I want to say he spoke more the, they call it the rancho Spanish, right? Cause his parents were, um, you know, not educated in school. They didn't go to first grade. They didn't go to elementary school, but they spoke it. So he spoke that. Well, you know, and I know that he, when he and I met, um, there was a lot of, of, um, embarrassment and fear because he couldn't, you know, cause he couldn't speak it well. And, you know, coming into a family like us that where we were fully bilingual, I mean, fully mm-hmm. bilingual, we could, you know, we could dish it out in English and we could dish it out in Spanish and we could dish it out, um, you know, right after another in, in both ways. And then when, you know, and, and then I was trilingual because I spoke, um, French because my other grandmother spoke French. So, you know, learning that language was, was, was tricky, but I know that he felt embarrassed. So talk to me about that. Did you feel embarrassed? Was there ever a time that you felt like you weren't good enough? Mm -hmm. Like I mentioned in elementary school, and then it kind of brought this shame of like, okay, you know, I'm a foreigner, you know, I'm from another place, you know, I'm not like everybody else you know, who was born here, you know, obviously I had the dark hair and the dark eyes, you know, where I grew up, there wasn't a lot of that, you know, everyone was, you know, super white with blonde hair, green eyes, blue eyes, you know, so I always felt like I stood out. But like I said, when I went to the other school, and I saw, okay, there's more of us, it's not just me looking like a space alien, (laughs) you know, there's (laughs) other people that look like me, you know, I felt like that slowly went away. But it wasn't until like I was in my 20s, 30s that I was like, okay, like, I have to accept where I'm from, even though I may not speak Spanish the greatest or too much. But like, that's just where my family's from. And, you know, I did learn more about the culture and the history, but just the Spanish part is not there. (laughs) But right, the language, just the language. Yeah, so like, I know the music, I know the food, the holidays and things like that. There and you like go. My my boyfriend's American and he's like, well, he's like, show me, show me Mexican food. Show me this. Show me that. And I'm like, OK, I can do that, you know. But you're American. Mm-hmm. I'm American. And, yeah. and so that's what we need to come to terms with is the fact that uh, it's a, we're a melting pot. When somebody says he's American, no, he's probably, you know, and, and if his you family's him, Scottish. Yeah, see, I was just going to say, and he's probably, you know, even though he was born here, he's, you know, comes from, we all here in the U.S. Come came from, from immigrant parents. Mm-hmm. So, you know, or grandparents, let's say, even immigrant grandparents, Scottish, mm-hmm. you know, like my mom was Spanish and German and my father was, you know, Greek and, and Mexican and, you know, and and you, you go through that and, and then... And then you take those, those, those tests, you know, like 23 and me, and, um, and then you look through ancestry.com and all of that. And then you realize, wait a minute, I'm not who I thought I was. Yep. (laughs) Yep. 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 So how has this, let me just get into, um, into business now, because, you know, we're talking about you, um, you are, um, you are a marketing manager. So, um, you know, and you're also, you have been an entrepreneur for the long, I've known you as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So how has, um, how has this stigma of not being able to speak Spanish affected or not affected you? It hasn't. Okay. And do you think that's because you haven't let it affect you? Mm-hmm. And it's not something that I focus on. You know, I try to focus on other things that I can actually bring to the table. And I don't think, you know, that is a problem or anything. So um, let me ask you this. So, so I know that for me, I always felt caught in the middle. 
I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't Mexican enough looking and I wasn't white enough looking. So Mm -hmm. there was a time period in my life and I just want to see if there's a parallel here with you. There was a time period in my life where I didn't feel I belonged either in the U S or in Mexico. Mm -hmm. That happened to me when we moved to San Diego. Cause like I said before, it was like, everything was fine. You know, I didn't, I don't know if this sounds bad or not, but like, I never, like, I knew I wasn't born here. Like I knew it was from another place, but I never really identified with it. Like I was never like, when I was a kid, I never was like, Oh, I'm Mexican. You know, I was born in Mexico. Like my family's from so-and-so, you know, cause I wasn't raised around the culture at all. It was like, okay, we celebrate Thanksgiving and we do all the American things. When, when we came to San Diego and like, you know, I met more Mexican people and they're like, yeah, we don't do Thanksgiving. To me, that was weird. I'm like, how can you not do Thanksgiving? I know. You know, you know, just little things like that. And it wasn't until I was here, then I was like, okay, well, I need to like learn more about like where the family's from, you know, um, so that's when I was kind of like, well, I'm not really from here, but I'm not really from there either. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, well, we have our own way of doing things, you know, like we can right. celebrate Thanksgiving. We can celebrate, you know, both Independence Day is like it's not no one can tell you what to do, you know. Right. Right. So let me ask you this now. Um, why mm-hmm. now we're going to get into the business aspect. Why? Do you, why are you still an entrepreneur and a job person? Because I like multiple streams of income. Ah, she learned something from me. Okay. Yes, that's true. But tell me a little bit about what do you feel when you're working for yourself? And mm-hmm. then what do you feel when you're working for somebody else? I like, you know, working for myself, I like the freedom like you know you can choose when you want to do the work you know you choose the people that you work with you know if you're a service provider like I am um and I just don't feel like you're so pigeonholed to do one thing it's like you know when I first started I was doing like social media you know I was writing blogs you know I was like helping web developers build the websites and you know I know how to do email marketing and all these things but I learned that because I was open to it. And that's what I did when I was working for myself. And so with everything that I learned working for myself with the clients that I had, that helped me get, you know, the corporate job, because I never really had a corporate job, I did everything on my own. Mm -hmm. So with everything that I learned, I was able to take it and get a six figure corporate job. Okay, great. Well, that's, that's amazing. And yes, I agree with you. One of the things that I want to make sure that, you know, this is an entrepreneurial where we get raw and real. And the truth of the matter is you've got to be, you've got to really believe in multiple streams of income. You really do. And you've got to open yourself because if there comes a time where your main big stream of income goes away, I was there been there, done that. My big mainstream, um, you know, income went away and whoa, you know, it was, it was, it was like an eye opener and it was that I I felt like I was going down, 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 down. I hit crash. And then that's when I woke up and said, no, this isn't going to happen anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to put my eggs all in one basket. What do you think Mm -hmm. about that? No, I agree, because I've been in similar situations this year where, you know, I got my I got a big corporate job. I was only there for a month. You know, they let me go. And then, uh, you know, luckily at the time, like I still had my freelance clients, you know, and I was selling clothes and, you know, doing all these other things. So it's like I still had money coming in. It wasn't like I was completely dried out, but like it made me feel better that, you know, I didn't rely solely on one thing, you know, to get by. Right. Right. Yeah, that's that's critically important. And um, so let me just ask for a couple of words of wisdoms for those Latinas that that do not speak Spanish. What would you say to them? I would say, you know, don't take it personally when people give you hate, you know, like, why don't you speak Spanish? You know, it's a choice if you don't speak it or if you do speak it. 
and just, you know, be confident in who you are. And if you really want to learn the language, you know, there's always the option to, there's a lot of ways now to learn it, you know, with apps, going back to school or, you know, I don't know, there's just ways that you can do it. So, you know, if you feel confident, feel good, not speaking Spanish like me, like that's totally fine. And if you want to learn it, you know, you have the option to, so like, just do what's best for you at the end. At the end. Yes. Yes. Now let me ask you this. Um, mm -hmm. Your entrepreneur job uh, that you, that you do right now, you work with, um, you are a, um, would you say you're a, that you're like a, a podcast? Um, I don't know what, what, what do you call yourself? I mean, what do you, wh how do you introduce yourself when, or how do you find clients? That's going to be important. How? Um, I would say with networking, networking is very important. I have I had a lot of people just reach out to me on LinkedIn because on my LinkedIn, you know, I have that I'm a freelance, you know, and I list all the different things that I can okay. do. So I've, I've learned that, you know, through LinkedIn, you know, I've also made good relationships with, you know, my clients as well. You know, if they know someone that needs help, you know, that always comes my way. Also, one thing that I really learned this year was, to make relationships with recruiters, which may be weird, but, you know, they always are looking for someone on a project basis or, you know, someone to cover for somebody's maternity leave or, you know, whatever. So I've learned that that's also like a great option if you want to do like done for you work, you know, provide that for people. So I would say networking is the number one thing. Networking. Yes. Yes. And so where can people find you and all your goodness on social media? Not on social media anymore, at least business wise. But you can okay. find me on LinkedIn. Okay, they I'll can send find you, you on LinkedIn. Yeah, I'll send you my profile link, but I'm on LinkedIn. Okay. Why don't you do social media anymore? Because I'm Interesting. lazy. <laughs> I'm lazy now. <laughs> she doesn't need to do it anymore, so she's not going to. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not on social media. Like I have my personal stuff, but like business right. wise, I'm not on there anymore. Okay. And I know that you did um, Kajabi for a while. You were a Kajabi expert. Mm -hmm. So I want people to know that um, if you ever need a Kajabi expert, you have to seek her out. She knows her stuff. And Kajabi, I don't, you know, they, they claim that they're user friendly. And I would say they're not. <laughs> no, especially when you need to build the landing pages and do the email nurturing sequences. Those are always Yes, Challenge. you definitely need somebody like that. So uh, Leticia, thank you so much for um, coming on. Um, like I said, this week is why don't you speak Spanish? And you're the first one. You're the first one. And like I said, in Friday, I have another another awesome, you know, entrepreneur woman creator of some awesome stuff. And she's also going to tell us what she feels like and why she doesn't speak Spanish. But um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. And, um, and I, if you guys have any questions, reach out to me. I am on social media. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I know. <laughs> send me a DM if you want to um, connect with her. Or if you're not on LinkedIn, I will definitely send you forward to her. And I appreciate your time. Miha, I, you know, you. you have grown. You're like my daughter. You've, you've gr <laughs> I've seen you grow. <laughs> I know. I've seen you grow from, you know, student into beautiful, successful, thriving young woman. And I wish you all the best. And thank you so much, Madre. Thank and you. Have a great one. You too. Thank you. This episode brought to you by Celaviv Hydrating and Lifting Sheet Mask. The Celaviv Hydrating and Lifting Sheet Mask locks in intense moisture to perfectly prime your skin for restful sleep. Apply this relaxing hydration serum several times a week to pamper yourself and radiate your healthier looking complexion. 
Sheet masking is all the rage right now. Make it a regular part of your healthy skincare regimen today. Celevive Hydrating and Lifting Sheet Mask. Click the link below and get yours today.